everyone, we're going to begin our lunch program. Sticking to the schedule, so time now is time we don't get to hear from Ryan Newman. I guarantee that's going to be more interesting. Um, welcome, everybody. As Vice President at the Federalist Society for Strategic Initiatives and Director of the Freedom of Thought Project, I want to welcome everyone to the fireside chat portion of today's Freedom of Thought conference. Thanks to our audience here in the room and to people watching online and watching on C-SPAN. Unfortunately, we have no literal fire. Um, but we do have James Burnham and Ryan Newman talking about corporate power and the rule of law, so I feel like that will suffice. Um, the bios are on the website, so just the essentials. James Burnham served in the last administration and is a lawyer here in DC. And Ryan Newman is best known for serving currently as the general counsel to the governor of Florida. Thank you all for joining us. The floor is yours. All right. All right. Uh, so I, I asked the questions, so you have, to, you, have, you have to wait till I, I go and then, and then you go. So I have to do two, two disclaimers. So, so first, I'm, I, I am only asking questions. Uh, and second, I'm only speaking here for myself, not my current employer or anyone else. I'm actually switching jobs next week. So for those of you who know me, find me later, I'll tell you what I'm up to. All right, let's get started. Ryan, could you start just by telling everyone kind of about your personal background, your political views, your legal views? You know, in my experience, you're a pretty conservative guy. Maybe you get a third Coke at dinner. Uh, that's, about, that's about as wild as things get for, for Mr. Newman. Yeah, pretty conservative is probably uh, a massive <laughs> understatement, uh, actually. And um, yeah, I'm so conservative, I still have an AOL email address. Uh, You're like you my know, great grandfather, the, basically. Yeah, yeah, I'm a rock amidst the winds of change. Um, yeah, so your, <laughs> your question about my back, where, where, where do you want me to start? Where I was born? <laughs> Uh, <laughs> what formed you as a young conservative? Like when you were, a, you know, a law student, you know? What yeah, was I can't recall ever having a liberal thought uh, <laughs> my, my entire life. Um, but I was raised in, um, you know, southeast New Mexico, uh, which is known as Little Texas. And it's culturally, politically indistinguishable from West Texas. Uh, oil and gas country, uh, God-fearing people. Um, went to the army. You know, so that obviously, uh, um, you know, somebody with my kind of predisposition uh, would, you know, be attracted to that. Um, then I decided to make the fateful choice of going, of going to law school. Um, and I've been blessed to, you know, have clerked at all levels of the federal judiciary for Judge Richard Leon and the district court here in Washington, um, then Chief Judge Edmondson in the 11th Circuit, and then uh, Justice Alito in the Supreme Court, worked at Jones Day, a uh, great firm. Spent some time on the Hill as chief counsel to uh, Senator, Senator Cruz, um, then went into the Trump administration where I was the um, acting uh, assistant attorney general for the Office of Legal Policy where we worked closely together, a deputy general counsel at the Department of Defense, and then uh, the national security counselor to Attorney General Parr. Uh, so I think I've never worked for a squish in my life. No, you're a pretty conservative um, guy. <laughs> so, um, yeah, but I think, you know, in sort of thinking a little bit about, you know, sort of my political and legal views, I guess one thing that was really formative for me was uh, Russell Kirk and reading The Conservative Mind, you know, over, over 20 years ago now. Because that, so before then, I was just kind of uh, dispositionally uh, conservative, you know, based on my upbringing and things like that. But I think, and, and you know, not going to necessarily uh, agree with everything uh, in the conservative in the conservative mind. Um, but it really did sort of help me begin to shape my understanding of what it actually means uh, to be a conservative. And one of the things that I loved about the book, and I've loved about Russell Kirk is he sort of outlines some principles. Well, what does it actually, what does it mean to be conservative? And the, the very first one um, is that there exists an enduring moral order. That this moral order is grounded in human nature and it's, it's constant. And moral truths are permanent. Um, that's one principle. 
Another principle is the principle of uh, continuity and custom and convention. Um, you know, conservatives tend to prefer the devil that we know to the devil that we don't. And so conservatives tend not to like to embrace uh, utopian sort of schemes. And then there's, of course, the principle of prescription that Russell Kirk talks about. Um, he said, I, I always love this line from Russell Kirk, he said, the individual is foolish, but the species is wise. Um, we don't believe in reinventing society every generation. We humans actually need, we need norms, right? We need standards. It gives us and our lives stability so that we can, so that we can flourish. Um, he talks about the principle of prudence. We should never let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Um, well, this is another principle that Russell Clark talked about and kind of connected with, with conservatism. We actually appreciate variety in the world. We understand that human societies, human civilization is, is complex and intricate and we value and appreciate that against the leveling tendencies of utopian schemes. Conservatives recognize that uh, humans are not perfectible, as it turns out. As much as we may try to perfect ourselves, it's best to accept that and understand it. Conservatives also believe in private property, and that that private property is essential for, is essential precondition for freedom. Conservatives also believe in voluntary associations, not collectivist, involuntary collectivist schemes. Conservatives believe in prudent restraints on power, so the separation of powers embodied in our Constitution is a, is a conservative concept. But conservatives also appreciate and understand the need for authority in government, and it's in that tension between you know, individual liberty and the need for that that uh, we appreciate. And, and so we try to strike a reasonable balance between those two things. Um, and then the last principle of, of Russell Kirk's book, which I love, I, I mean, how can you not love this? <laughs> um, is that permanence and change have to be reconciled. I mean, we live in a society that's always talking about change and progress and moving forward. And that's not necessarily a, a bad thing, but it's not the only thing. I mean, there always has to be something that draws you back to the past, too. And a good society, a vigorous society, is constantly reconciling those two things, change uh, versus permanence. And I always like G.K. Chesterton kind of made the point that, look, as conservatives, you, know, you always have to be uh, you know, renewing our institutions, right? And I think he, if I remember the story correctly, or the analogy, you know, he talked about a, a fence post that's painted white. And if, you, if you're not constantly repainting it, you know, it'll fade, and then the paint will come off, and then the wood will rot. And the good conservative is constantly painting it, making sure that it stays in good form. So from a high-level perspective, that's kind of um, my, my sort of view. I, I'm a kind of conservative, uh, Kirk kind of conservative. But in terms of more practical things, and I know you're going to about yeah. to ask me a question. More practical things. You just keep going. Um, <laughs> more uh, sort of practical, practical things. Look, I'm a social conservative. Morality and re religion are indispensable supports to a free society. That's what our founders believed, and I, I believe that as well. I'm a cultural conservative. You know, I believe that um, America is actually more than just a propositional nation. Uh, the propositional, the American creed is certainly part of being American, but it's not the sum total of being an American. We as Americans do have a history that's ours. We have our own traditions and culture, and that's part of being an American. And we're great at uh, absorbing um, people from all over the world into our culture, which makes us a special, a special country. But the idea that America can really just only be a propositional nature, I just don't think is, is accurate. Uh, strong belief in private property and free enterprise, obviously. But private property, or at least free enterprise, free trade, is not the sum total of society. That's not the only end of society that has to be balanced against other interests in society. Um, the well-being of our middle and working classes, national security, 
um, that sort of thing. On foreign policy, you know, American foreign policy should serve concrete interests of the American people, not abstract uh, interests of this so-called sort of role-based global order, whatever that means. Um, and then you asked me, I think, about sort of my what, legal... Well, let, why don't we, let me, say, let me just... I'm an, I'm an originalist, but, yeah, with a, but we're with gonna talk, asterisk, and yeah. we should talk about that later. Well, we're going to, I think, we'll, we'll talk about the asterisk, we'll talk about all of it. Okay. Uh, let, me, let me just try to steer this a little bit to the, uh, to the corporate stuff. So, you know, when you, when you and I were coming up, I mean, all the stuff you just said basically led us to view, because I think a lot, many of the same things you do, to view the government as kind of the bad guy. So, like, Ronald Reagan's very famous phrase, you know, nobody wants to open the door and see some guy there, maybe Director Chopra, saying, I'm... <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, I'm from the government, and I'm here to help. Uh, that's still true to a degree, probably, I'm sure, you know, uh, although you can welcome to come to my house. Um, but in the last decade or so, it feels like something has, has really shifted, uh, and it's really kind of crazy. And I, I think now a lot of people might be terrified to open the door and see somebody there who says, hey, I'm from Disney, and I'm here to help. <laughs> Uh, and I'm just wondering, you know, why, if you have any thoughts on that, if you think that's true, and if so, why you think that is? Well, I, at this point, if anybody comes to the door, well, your and, door. And, and asks, <laughs> asks to help, or, you know, they're probably going to get the door slammed in their face. And that's largely because, honestly, Americans have lost trust in basically every institution of American society. I mean, whether it's the government or whether it's, I mean, even the military, uh, confidence in the military is, is, is declining. Uh, sort of confidence in the media, of course, is in the tank. And, and that's no different for uh, corporate America. I mean, Americans have always been a little skeptical of corporations. You could trace that all the way back to statements from, you know, the founding generation, of course, then the progressive era and so forth. Um, corporate America, though, had a rebound, obviously, in the Reagan, Reagan years, and that was a reaction to you know, the failures of the great society in the 1970s, which, were, which was a disaster. And so everybody, you know, um, sort of regained confidence, at least in corporate America, even as it, their faith in government was uh, declining. But I think, um, so what we're facing right now is the reality that corporations, at least the biggest ones, kind of broke in faith with um, the American worker, for the most part. Um, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a number of ways. One, um, you know, corporations are exporting jobs and wanting to import labor. Um, I think corporations are sort of more multinational and cosmopolitan in their outlook. I mean, it was corporate America that was the arsenal of democracy during World, during World War II. Uh, but now I think they have greater allegiances to, you know, to this global world order, whatever you want to call it than they do to the American people. And I think that's grating on a lot of Americans. But I think the, the straw that sort of broke the camel's back on this is, generally speaking, corporations have voided the culture war and have tried to part, you know, uh, sort of um, chart a path um, where they're not necessarily taking sides and I think that has completely changed. They've, they're, they're, they've, they've taken a side. They're on the side of the cultural revolutionaries. Um, and they're at odds with, I think, middle America in really significant ways. And um, I think you know, a lot of people in the political class are beginning to uh, appreciate that now. And, um, and I think that's driving a lot of the change that you're, that you're talking about. So maybe we could talk about a couple possible causes and then maybe some solutions, including what the free state of Florida has done to try to deal with this. So, you know, one theory people talk about is that we're just sort of, it's sort of a function of late stage capitalism. So, you know, in the, in the sort of glory days or whatever you want to call it, you know, these big companies were run by these visionary guys or gals, John Rockefeller, Henry Ford, Walt Disney, Dagny Taggart, uh, and we are today largely stuck with corporate behemoths run by anonymous managers who were sort of bred and raised in the controlled environment of like five schools, all in the New England, all on the seaboard, and all with basically teaching them the same basic values that they've been inculcated from birth to, you know, corporate C-suite, uh, with the very important exception, I would say, of, of Elon Musk, uh, who obviously does not, I mean, is the old mold, not the new mold. Do you think that's, you know, that sort of 
evolution is part of what's going on and the cause, or what do you think? Yeah, I don't think there's any question about that. I, 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 I agree. Um, there's a big difference between builders and managers. Uh, builders are visionary, you know, they identify problems and then they go out and fix them. Um, they're not afraid to take risks. Uh, they're more personally invested in the sort of the enterprise that they're advancing uh, than a manager is. I mean, managers basically take what somebody else created and just try not to screw it up um, and tend to be, you know, risk averse. Managers are trained to be managers. Um, and, um, you know, the goal is just to keep things, uh, kind of keep things going, uh, but not to really innovate, um, create, and, um, you know, move the ball forward. Um, you mentioned the Ivy League. I think that's absolutely right. Managers are trained and they're educated at our, you know, sort of best universities. They're, they go to business school, all that. And I think, I think that's the nexus, though, that's creating the problem that we're seeing um, today. Um, I guess one, one, one other point I just wanted to, I wanted to make. I guess one of your, somebody who shares your name, mm, yes. actually wrote a little bit about this. Um, we're, James we're, Burnham. I am not that manager, James Burnham. Uh, Manitorial Revolution. I'm not, You're not that? No, I'm not him. Related. No, I'm not 150. I don't think we're, we're probably related. Yeah, he's my grandpa. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> but he actually talked about this. You know, He said at the time, he wrote a book in the 1940s, The Managerial Revolution, where he sort of talks about this and basically says, look, the society that's emerging is not going to be a capitalist insofar as the, um, the owners of capital control the means of production. But he also said it's not going to be socialist either, where the government does. Instead, what's going to happen is m managers are going to run everything. Uh, so they're going to control the means of production, even though they're not the owners of capital. And on top of that, they're going to be supervised by you know, experts you know, in the government and the bureaucracy. And so we were just going to have a society that's run by these managers. Well, I think that's pretty much how things have played out. And, uh, and so we've created this sort of managerial uh, elite or managerial ruling class, whatever you wanna, however you want to characterize it. And, and access to this class, though, is controlled by the uh, education credentialing process. Right? You've got to go to the right schools. Uh, get educated in the right way, and then you get to be, you know, a member of this class. And so, you know, all these individuals, for the most part, have been educated in a university system that's increasingly radicalizing. So, is not any surprise then that the managerial elite, you know, is buying into all of these sort of um, fringe ideas that um, the American people, for the most part, aren't really buying into? But I, I do think it explains this huge disconnect between the people who are running our institutions on the one hand and you know, the American people who are, who are trying to hang on to their, their, sanity, their sanity and common sense. Yeah, so let me ask you then, uh, so that's sort of on the, the, co the corporation side. Let me ask you about the public capital markets, the, the securities markets, which is an issue uh, that Governor DeSantis has been very vocal about and active on. Uh, and this is my longest question, but I'll do it as quick as I can. So a, a basic tenet of corporate governance is obviously that shareholders will demand value maximization and that they and the board will require managers to pursue profits rather than just treat the public company that the managers do not own but are entrusted to run as their own plaything. Pretty good theory. Good theory. Okay, but what if the shareholders, just hypothetically, aren't actually the shareholders? What if the shareholders are like six investment funds that take all of our money, you know, trillions, tr literally with a, with a T, trillions of dollars, uh, and invest it on our behalf? Now, that makes sense. You know, I don't have time. We don't have us have time to, like, go study CVS's profit and loss statement or whatever and figure out if, you know, what, what's going to happen next quarter. So it makes sense that you would have these guys do that. But now imagine, just hypothetically, that the guys who run these funds and the gals who run these funds have figured out that they have enormous power to use the trillions of dollars that they manage on our behalf to bend, but we're not paying attention, uh, to bend public companies to their will in ways that are not just related to maximizing profits, that are related to pursuing, you know, so-called woke policies or, you know, whatever the managers prefer. And then if they've actually started to do that. Do you think that is a fair description of at least part of what's happening today? And if so, is that, is that a free market? I mean, is that even capitalism? I don't know what that is. Or is that just social engineering at the hands of, you know, BlackRock rather than the Politburo? 
It's a great leading Just question. ask a question. A, a, I'm just asking questions. Great, great leading question. <laughs> I don't know. What do you think? <laughs> well, I do think it's actually, I, I, didn't, I was reading about, you know, about this the other day, and I, I guess I didn't really appreciate the effect that um, sort of the, the mass privatization of, of pensions and retirement savings would have, you know, on the, on the economy writ large. But, you know, we created this whole process that incentivizes, you know, people to put money into the, you know, into, the, into mutual funds or into the stock market, 501Ks, things like that. Um, you know, of course, companies have been wo moving away from defined benefit um, uh, pensions and so forth. And so we've created uh, this, this whole apparatus of the, of the asset manager, the fund manager. Um, and, uh, you know, the power of this uh, thing, um, I think, went underappreciated until relatively recently. And then to discover that the big three asset managers, you know, BlackRock, State Street, and Vanguard, control, you know, a sizable, I, I, I don't know what the exact percentage is, but a massive percentage of all of the assets under management. Um, it's kind of a, a frightening thing. It's especially frightening when you learn that they're using that immense power, and it's not their own money, that's the thing, it's other people's money, um, that they're using to advance a social, cultural, sort of political uh, agenda. I don't really think that that's, um, you know, the, the, the free market per se. I mean, they try to couch it as that. I mean, right, they have their arguments for why they're adhering to their fiduciary responsibilities, and you know, they conjure up arguments for no, why this, you know, why this makes sense, and we're, you know, this is value, you know, sort of maximizing the value of these investments. I mean, they have their arguments, but it just strikes me as bunk, <laughs> honestly. <laughs> Um, it's clear what they're doing. They've got an agenda. It's a cultural and social agenda. It's not really an economic one. And, you know, in fairness to them, some of this is driven by the government itself, right? I mean, they can, they can argue for why de DEI programs are necessary for corporations because the civil rights laws have been weaponized um, by activist uh, litigators and the courts. Um, in ways that incentivize companies to, to go down the DEI path. And, and of course, you know, government's creating a self-fulfilling prophecy in a lot of ways uh, when it comes to climate change and that sort of thing, right? If you scare people enough into believing how big a problem it is, then the companies can say, well, this is why we need to restructure the entire way the American economy works uh, to address this problem. And so it's in our, the economic interests of our, um, of, of uh, you know the you know the shares were the, the, you know the people that were managing the assets for to do this sort of thing, and um, so you know there is this sort of symbiotic relationship between the asset managers and and what's going on uh, with the government. But either way, it's not really a true free market at work. I don't think. So that's a, a fairly substantial problem that you've identified. Potentially. Uh, what, what do you think the role, I mean, what role does government have to play here in dealing with this? And perhaps as importantly, what has the free state of Florida done about this in the time that Governor DeSantis has been there? All right, so, um, you know, the governor certainly um, <laughs> has not been afraid uh, to take on some of these interests. And, um, you know, it's, not a standard position uh, that re you know, rep Republican politicians have, have taken in the past. But I do think he appreciates that for people to live fulfilling um, lives, it doesn't matter who's telling you what to do at the end of the day, if it's the government or some private entity um, that's powerful enough to affect the way you live. Either way, it's an impairment or infringement in some way on, uh, on an individual's ability to sort of live out their lives and pursue um, you know, their, 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 their own good, at least as they see it. Um, so to the extent that yes, corporate power is being uh, sort of weaponized by this managerial elite that I was referring to, to pursue a cultural, political, uh, social agenda that has nothing to do with the obvious interests 
of the corporation. And yes, I think it's entirely appropriate for um, the people's representatives to stand, to stand up and protect uh, the interests of their constituents. And I think that's a perfectly appropriate role for representative institutions. I mean, sometimes we, for, we talk about the government, the government, and yes, the government does, is not perfect, the government, um, you know, especially the bureaucracy can be oppressive, and we should always work to, to limit that. But we also can't forget um, at the same time that the government actually, as it turns out, happens to be us, uh, at least if we still believe in our Republican institutions. And, um, and I try to remind folks, I was, uh, sometimes when I'm interviewing folks for judicial, um, uh, you know, for judicial appointment in Florida, you know, I ask, well, you know, what's the, you know, what's the true purpose of government? What's the ultimate goal? What's the ultimate purpose of government? Is it just to secure the blessings of the liberty? Is that it? Or is it something more holistic than that? Um, and we have a nice little back and forth. And a lot of people, you know, they say, no, oh, it's the protection of liberty is the ultimate end purpose of government. And that's certainly one purpose. But they completely forget that the, the most pure encapsulation of what government is for is in the preamble to the United States Constitution. And secu that securing the blessings of liberty is certainly one. But um, providing for the general welfare, um, ensuring domestic tranquility, establishing justice are all parts of it as well. And then I try to remind folks that, um, actually when you go and look at the Declaration of Independence, because most people focus on the first part of the Declaration of Independence about inalienable rights and all that. But they forget that the Declaration of Independence first and foremost was a statement of grievances against, uh, against the crown. And what's the very first, go look at what the very first grievance is. And it's not actually about anything to do with you know, sort of individual liberty. It's about the inability uh, or the refusal of the crown to give assent to the laws that had been enacted by the colonial legislatures. In other words, they were fr frustrated that the crown was interfering with their ability to govern themselves. And um, that's one of the things I also like about Justice Scalia's uh, dissent in Obergefell, because he said, you know, the one liberty that's at most at risk here is the right of Americans to actually govern themselves. And to me, that's the greatest threat that uh, Americans face today is the, is the thought and the belief that I think is growing in this country that they don't actually control their government anymore. And, um, and so, yeah, I think to the extent that there are corporate interests at work in our society that are trying to undermine uh, the values and well-being of individual uh, Americans, and I think representative institutions have more than, especially at the state level, and I want to get, you know, we can get into federalism issues, but certainly at the state level, uh, representative institutions have the authority to step in and protect people, um, because that's what this is about at the end of the day, people, uh, not corporations. So, so then let me ask you two kind of pushback questions. They're, they're related, but they're a little different. The first is, you know, I think some critics of the governor and, and sort of some of the points you made would say, okay, but, you know, as soon as we start fooling around with, you know, what companies are allowed to do, basically, what the private sector is allowed to do, you know, it, there's really no difference between that and sort of government top-down, you know, central planning type stuff, and we're going to make it impossible for them to m make widgets or s ship packages or make movies or whatever it is the company does, and that's bad and that's dumb, and we've seen that fail thousands of times all across history, and so why is this not that and going to lead to the same place? And then, and then the sort of related question is, okay, well, but if we, if we take, if we drop the sort of Reaganist principled view that government is generally invariably bad, um, and private sector is generally invariably good, aren't the blue states then going to just rush out and get even wackier and do even more things that make it impossible to run a business in America, you know, at the cost to regular people like the folks we're talking about protecting? All right, so there's, there, there's a lot. Yeah, there's sorry, those are big questions. Um, well, I think let's not lose sight of the fact that what is drawing um, this attention on corporate America is the fact that they're not even really behaving as sane uh, corporate actors, uh, right? Like the, the obsession with cultural issues that have nothing to do with their business interests. 
um, is what's driving this reaction. So if you're concerned about, well, all of a sudden we're going to start regulating <clears throat> or, or preventing them from making widgets, uh, you know, I, 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 less, I don't see that happening. Um, I think what our focus is on is we just, we want them to make the widgets. I mean, that's the problem. Go make the widgets, <laughs> you know? Make the best freaking widgets put, that you can make. Put that on a bumper sticker. <laughs> you know? I mean, we are all Go for make the making widgets. the widgets. Make the widgets. And, um, but you know what? Do not subject people to woke ideology at the workplace. You know what? Don't waste corporate resources advancing woke ideology, you know? That's what we're talking about here. We're not talking about the widgets. We're not talking about the tire making. You know, we want them to do that, absolutely. Uh, but to the extent that the corporation is being used and being weaponized for cultural and ideological purposes that have nothing to do, nothing to do with the interests of the corporation, well, that's a problem. And, um, and that ought to be, to, to be addressed. And, um, you know, Disney is an excellent example of this, um, actually. Um, you know, the state of, the, the legislature in the state of Florida passes a, a fairly, I think, a perfectly reasonable law that in public schools in the state of Florida, there will not be classroom education or instruction on gender identity and sexual orientation in grades kindergarten through third grade. That is what the law that is what the law did. And yet the Disney company decided that it was gonna make it its corporate mission uh, to work for the re repeal of that legislation. Well, what in the world does this bill and what is taught to kindergartners in Florida on sexual orientation and gender identity, what does any of that have to do with the business interests of the Disney Corporation? Absolutely, absolutely nothing. Um, and so look, we just want corporations to go back the way they were. And that's the thing, I mean, from a conservative perspective, we're not even advocating that, you know, look, we want, we're not trying to turn, you know, we're not wanting these corporations to turn into, you know, advocates for our side in the cultural war. We just want them to be neutral and to go about the business of making widgets. Um, and so I do think it's appropriate for, um, you know, legislatures to put back, push back against that. Let's not forget too, and I, I, I was gonna sort of talk about all the, the crazy things that corporations do. Not only do they just take positions, right, on, you know, divisive and uh, controversial uh, political, cultural, and ideological issues that have nothing to do uh, with their business interests, but they also finance um, a lot of these, um, of, of these things. I mean, corporations are, you know, funding Planned Parenthood. Corporations fund, you know, the human rights campaign on a massive scale. Uh, corporations, you know, funded the Black Lives Matter movement, <clears throat> which, um, you know, sounds great on paper, but when you look at what the movement stands for, well, you kind of begin to wonder what in the world is, are these public corporations, you know, financing this for? Um, they subject their employees to, you know, outrageous indoctrination uh, training. Um, and not only that, but they f fire employees. I mean, think of, uh, you know, the CEO of Mozilla created the dead gum company. And then because somebody found out that he gave 200 bucks or however much it was uh, in support of traditional marriage, the next thing you know, he's out in the, on the street. Um, you know, Corporations have no business in using their immense power and influence to control, manipulate people on ideological questions that have nothing to do with the business interests of the corporation. And so I think what we should all be thinking about is how do we draw appropriate lines so that corporations can do what, what, um, you know, what they're made to do, uh, which is make widgets, make the best dead gum widgets you know, known to man, and um, you know, increase the prosperity of our people, but stay out of politics and stay out of the culture wars. I think that's a, that's a reasonable, uh, reasonable line to draw.
Um, all right, so what about, let's talk about law just for a second. So we, I told, promise we'd get back to it. Uh, you and I both believe the law means what it says, I think, and the, the words in the legal text matter. You can't make stuff up. We're both originalists. I don't know, you'll have to explain the asterisk. Maybe you will. Um, I don't have an asterisk. Uh, and, and I'm just wondering, you know, it seems to me that even that if you're a principled originalist, there's a lot of doctrines that have grown up in sort of the 90s. We'll call it the Kennedy Court. Um, that protect big business but are, you know, questionable on originalist grounds. You know, I haven't had time to really study Mallory yesterday's opinion from Justice Gorsuch because I've been getting ready for this. Um, but, like, you know, personal jurisdiction might be one example. I don't know. Are there doctrines along these lines that you think are sort of, I don't know, vulnerable on originalist grounds? And I, I want to point out specifically and to, very close to home because I know you're an Alito clerk. You know, I did notice that Disney's main case an irony of all ironies is Citizens United uh, in their lawsuit against America's governor uh, for infringing on their corporate free speech rights because, you know, corporations are people now. <laughs> right. So, um, yes, this, this question of corporate free speech rights I've been obsessing over for the past <laughs> I can uh, imagine. Months, as you as you probably can imagine. And, yes, Disney did um, in their filings against uh, the state rely on Citizens United. In fact, I thought I would quote uh, part of the complaint uh, to you all, which I, I got a kick out of. I said, uh, let's see here, Disney finds itself in this regrettable position because it expressed a viewpoint the governor and his allies did not like. Disney wishes that things could have been resolved a different way. But Disney also knows that it is fortunate, fortunate to have the resources to take a stand against the state's retaliation, a stand smaller businesses and individuals might not be able to take when the state comes after them for expressing their own views. Uh, so, so, so like, you know, you know, Disney standing up for the little guy there. Uh, in America, and this, is, this was my favorite part, in America, the government cannot punish you for speaking your mind. Now, that's true. I think the question is, though, whether Disney has a mind. I mean, whose mind are we talking about exactly? Um, and the fact that they even put that in the complaint was, was remarkable, and I couldn't, even, I couldn't help you know, getting a little chuckle out of it because it's absurd. Um, it's, it's, it's completely and totally absurd. Um, Disney is not a mind. In a way, it's not even really a collection of minds because the ostensible owners of the corporation, these shareholders, are just passive investors in this enterprise with little to no control over anything Disney says or does on their behalf. And so what we're really talking about is the mind of the CEO. Um, well, but that's not the corporation. And this is what's so dangerous uh, when, you, when you try to graft uh, free speech rights onto a publicly traded corporation because it's not really the corporations that's speaking, it's the, it's the CEO. And it can, can get a little difficult to discern whether or not the CEO is speaking for himself uh, or speaking on behalf of all of those shareholders. Um, and then it becomes even more absurd uh, when you consider the fact that the shareholders themselves oftentimes aren't even people. Um, they're institutional investors, asset managers, or their corporation, other corporations themselves. And so, with respect to Citizens United, on the facts of that case, it's a absolutely correct uh, outcome in that case. Because there you had a nonprofit uh, corporation, uh, small, that was organized for uh, expressive purposes. And so obviously, uh, you know, people don't give up their corporate, their, their sort of free speech rights simply because they organize in that way. But that, that is a universe of difference uh, from a, a widely held, publicly traded, multinational corporation. Um, and so I do think that we need to think a little bit more about how free speech rights apply in the corporate context. I don't have a, I'm not suggesting that I've got, you know, a bottom line final answer to this question. I'm just 
suggesting that perhaps we should give it a little bit more thought. And um, we also probably shouldn't lose sight of the fact that at the end of the day, that these rights um, belong to actual flesh and blood people with actual minds, and that they are grounded in natural rights. <clears throat> and um, pretty confident that there wasn't, uh, that the, the, the corporations didn't exist in the state of nature. Um, and so I think, I just think we need to think through this a little bit more and recognize that there's probably some limits to this notion uh, that free speech rights um, apply in full to the Disney Corporation, that you know, little old you and me are just like Disney uh, when it comes to- I, I, I suspect you were nothing like Disney. To, yeah, <laughs> to, you know, to the exercise of, of, of free speech rights. Um, look, I mean, they, they you know, rely on Citizens United. Um, that certainly appears to be the state of the law today. But I do think that um, a lot more thought can be put into this by by originalists, because I feel pretty confident uh, that I'd be surprised. I'd be really surprised if you actually reach the conclusion after exploring, you know, fully exploring the founder's thoughts about all of this, that a widely held publicly traded corporation is going to have the same free speech rights as, as an individual. But I do, I think it's critical to distinguish between the closely held company, so, you know, a, um, uh, like Hobby Lobby, right? Uh, on one hand, which is the, you know, it's a closely held company owned by the Green family. Uh, that's a world of difference between a, a multinational, widely held, publicly traded corporation. So I have one last question, um, and that's uh, hopefully a simple one, which is just what advice do you have for kind of your, your comrades in the audience, particularly the younger lawyers? I mean, to make a sort of obvious and an interesting observation, we are at a unique time in our law and in our politics. Uh, for all kinds of reasons. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, I don't know what I would want to do or what I would think I should be doing if I were, uh, you know, us 20 years ago back in law school trying to figure out my, my sort of life path because I think things have gotten scrambled in a big way uh, since that time. So, you know, you're much more in the fight than I am. I'm just curious what you would advise young people who want to, you know, try to get our country back, make it, make it a good place, what they should be doing. Well, um, other than work for the governor of Florida, <laughs> we're always we're always take, you know. To, uh, I know you need a lot of litigation counsel. <laughs> no, um, yeah, uh, yeah no, no kidding. Well, speaking of that, actually, oh, there you um, go. Don't go to big law. <laughs> don't go to big law. Uh, go work for, um, you know, Consvoy McCarthy or. Keller or Lahotsky or um, some of these smaller, more boutique firms that have a little bit more flexibility about the causes that they can fight for. Don't go represent massive corporations anymore. Go represent, you know, medium-sized firms, um, small businesses, uh, you know, people who share your worldview. They're the ones who need the help. Um, yeah, maybe you won't make as much money, but you'll still make a great living. And you'll also be able to pursue other interests. You know, you'll be able to be easier for you to serve your community or to get engaged in some of these political contests where, um, you know, uh, conservatives tend to be outgunned uh, by the left. Um, and then go work in state government, actually. Um, <laughs> After you know, spending about six years or so, um, both on the Hill you know, and in the Trump administration, I feel like I've accomplished, as part of the theme, as part of the DeSantis administration, more in the two years that I've been there than the six years I spent you know, uh, in federal service. You can, as it turns out, you can actually accomplish things in the states. And that's where the action that is where the action is at. And, um, and you know, state governments are more responsive to the people, uh, less burdened by bureaucracy and dysfunction. And uh, you'll actually be able to accomplish things. And I tell you what, it is liberating. I mean, to see bills get passed, it's incredible. 
um, and have a bureaucracy that's actually responsive to the, uh, you know, to the chief executive of the state. I mean, that's, that's incredible. Uh, didn't really get to experience that, federal government. Um, you know, so, uh, so yeah, I guess that's, that's, what my, that's what my advice would be. With that, I think we have another event. We have a 15-minute break. Lita's nodding. We have another event in the room you were in before, the name of which I don't know. You, you didn't have me explain my uh, originalism with an asterisk. Sorry, guys. He's got to explain the asterisk. So you have a 10-minute break. Please explain the asterisk. Okay. It's an audible. Well, so your original question, so he gave me the questions beforehand. So I, we were cheating a little bit. We're like Hillary uh, Clinton and that news <laughs> lady. <laughs> <laughs> Daughter Brazil. Yeah. <laughs> But your original question was along the lines of, should we stick with original? Oh, yeah. I was going to ask you about Adrian Vermeule and all that. I just ran out of time. So let's yeah, tell, so tell me why he's wrong and we're right. Well, I don't want to. I don't, I don't, <laughs> we should not. We sh absolutely should not abandon originalism. But it's not as though originalism has been tried and found wanting. In a lot of ways, it, originalism hasn't really been tried. True originalism hasn't been um, tried yet. Uh, I like and it. I know there's all of the, you know, all these questions about different styles of originalism and so on and so forth. But I, I do, th I do, and I just have one thing that I just want to throw out. To, and a lot of you have thought about this far more deeply, um, you know, than I have. But I think a lot of people think that originalism is just like a, a historical research enterprise. That you know, we'll find the answer in some dusty book somewhere. And. Um, and we, we dismiss the philosophical and moral content of the law as a result, because we don't want to do philosophy. We don't want to do philosophy. We don't want to talk about political or moral philosophy um, at all. We just hope that you know, there'll be some historical source that will give us the answer. And I just think that that will not suffice, because that will not ultimately supply the answers. Because to do originalism right, I think you have to internalize and embrace the moral and political philosophy of the founding generation. And that means originalists and lawyers, more generally, if you want to do constitutional law, I think need to spend a little, more, a little less time reading Justice Kennedy uh, <laughs> and more no time comment. <laughs> you know, really diving into the moral and political philosophy of the founders. And that means doing philosophy. And that means thinking about uh, the morals. Because you can't understand the scope of the free, extra, uh, the, the free speech clause unless you under, can have an appreciation for what the limits might have been. And you can't know that, I think, without understanding the moral and political philosophy of the founding generation. And that's what, you know, originalists have to embrace that and apply it. You're not, again, it's not the judge applying their own. Um, moral or political framework. It's an attempt to dispassionately uncover and understand the, the, the political and moral framework of the founding generation and, and then faithfully applying it you know, in circumstances and cases confronting the judge today. So anyway, that's the asterisk. And with that, you may now have a 10-minute break. <laughs>